Welcome to Dhaka Tribune Presents Straight Talk. I'm Zafar Subhan. My guest today is Maksud Haq, known to his fans, f friends, and followers is Mac, a legendary figure in the Dhaka music scene who really needs no introduction, is also a writer and activist as well as a musician. Mac, thank you very much for being here Thanks with us. Thanks for having me on the show, Zafar. Well, as I said, you don't need any introduction to anyone who's familiar with the music scene in Dhaka, but of course it wasn't always that way. I think what's interesting learning about you and learning about your career is how things started off with feedback back in 1976, I think. Tell us a little bit about the embryonic music scene when you first started playing here in Dhaka. Well, one, one's got to remember that the year after 71 were very hard times for us. Okay, yes, of course. Um, and uh, 72, 73, um, those were like turbulent years. Um, we, we were not economic well off. Yes. There was hardly any entertainment, entertainment for us. So we had, sure. you know, like Azam Khan and Fred Swahid, and they were the ones that were actually entertaining us. Yes. Uh, but interestingly, the musicians they had were all known to us because they were again from what is now the Hotel Intercontinental again. So some yes. of the best musicians that we were following That's right. were their backup bands. And uh, we, we instantly knew uh, that Bangla Rock is here to stay. Yeah. And uh, so the initial shows were mostly Azam Khan's shows and, you know, before Azam Khan, maybe Windy Side of Care would have a couple of uh, English songs also. Okay. So we would enjoy that, not, the, not that the whole crowd would like it. But some of us who understood in Western music and was this, this is a wonderful cover. Um, so from that point on, things uh, started moving. And then, um, then the death of Bongo Bondu in 75 suddenly changed all of that. Uh, ah. From 75 to 85, so to speak, uh, rock music kind of disappeared. Sure. Uh, we were considered uh, revisionists, we were considered counterculture, a lot of labels were tagged to our name. Long hair was a no-no, so we had to crop our, uh, cut our hair short. I had my, uh, <laughs> because I had long hair, I had my... Uh, chopped off by policemen somewhere in Farmgate. This actually. is like, for, you know, for those of us in 2018 listening to this, it's almost yeah, unthinkable. Because yeah. you, you know? have to understand, we, we just had gone under a military dictatorship, things sure. were bad, and there was absolutely no, I mean, it's a freedom of expression or the sort of rebelliousness that comes through rock yeah. was looked down upon. Oh, of course, they, they would no see it as a threat, probably. Yeah, so it was around that time that we decided that let's do something else. So um, things came up. I was studying in the Dhaka University of course, back then. Yeah. And I'd already made a small name for being able to do some good English covers uh, with a, my first band called Early Bird. So I had a s very small reputation among musicians who knew that Mac does deliver a few yeah. uh, English covers well. So one day I was at the Dhaka University, okay. uh, one break time, and suddenly uh, two members of Feedback come down to me to say, Mac, we've got a big show. Mm -hmm. And uh, the singer was Zakir. Yeah. Zakir, of course, is the younger brother of Muti Rahman of Protomalo. Yes. Again, my very dear friend. Uh, but I didn't know the inside story. So the, they said it's a long show. Zakir can't do it on his own. We might have to have 230 or so songs. So you have to at least do 10. So I kind of agreed and went rehearsed with them for two days, which just went out fine. And uh, it was a Cheshire ball, you know, a Cheshire foundation, which was very, very prim and proper with bow tie and cummerbund and ladies in grounds and all that. So I wasn't actually... So you uh, found that out later. Yeah. So that was a very successful show. What I didn't realize then was Zakir was actually, had got a scholarship to go and study in uh -huh. Russia. All right. And they had to have a singer. This was the Intercontinental's idea to see, and this was like an indirect audition. No, I, for I see me. how it is. Oh, how very so it took off from there. Sneaky. So from uh, from seventy six to basically mm -hmm. about eighty seven, we would we did house bands. So the whole gamut of, of Western music, whether it is rock mm -hmm. and jazz and reggae, to funk to blues. I mean, you name it. Yeah. Uh, most of the international covers, from Saturday Night Fever to Bob Marley to Dire Straits. Yeah. To Name it, whoever, even J.J. Kale or uh, when did it Isaac uh, Hayes, a whole, whole lot of it. When did it occur to you that, okay, you wanted to take this and then start the fusion, you know, for which you're very well known, with Bangla style music, with Bangla music, to really take it to the next level? Oh, this is very interesting because up, up until 85, uh, we were still in the hotel yeah. and feedback was planning on a Bengali album yeah. because um, sort of souls of Chittagong beat us to it. Yeah in 81, 82. So as mm -hmm. far as feedback was concerned, if souls can do it, we can do it better. Yeah. Because of course, we are banned from Dhaka, they were from Sitagong, and all that sort of thing came up. Yeah. But 
uh, I, I was extremely snobbish. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, no, bang Bangla songs are not for me. Mm -hmm. You guys carry on. And you'll be very surprised with the first feedback album called Feedback Feedback. Yes. I'm not there. That's right. You're not on. You're, you're uh, because I didn't realize that was yeah, the reason. Yeah. And, and I, mm -hmm. I just told them on the face, you guys carry on. Okay. Um, if there's an opportunity for me to do an English song in their song, they said there's no mm -hmm. market for it, Mac, let's forget it. So they went ahead and did the album, and uh, it, it was uh, quite a success. Yes, now, now that's right. By 86, 87, mm -hmm. things were also starting to change because yeah. uh, the old intercontinental was been broken down, and there was a lot of dispute whether it's going to be Sheraton, whether it's going to be taken over local management. So yeah. there was a lot of dispute. Sure. So the place where we used to play called the Chambeli restaurant was broken down. Yeah. And what they had in this place, because that uh, Chambeli restaurant was built by the French, yeah. It had a wonderful chandelier, and the acoustic was the best in the world. Of for a club of that side, could take in about 200 diners every night. Yeah. So the kind of crowd we were used to, and the kind of crowd we were making, this was the best place. Yeah. Once they broke it down, the whole ambience was gone. And even if the ambience was gone, uh, that wasn't the problem. The acoustics were finished. Yeah. And uh, the band would be you know, right next to the food dish. So it was like we're part of the chicken shashlik. You know? <laughs> okay, yes. So you have a chicken shashlik, and you see the band, and you go and eat. So. That we felt kind of degraded, and soon we realized that no, this is not yeah, a place. Yeah, that's not working out for you. So about a year yeah. of basic uh, door down feedback, I uh, wasn't very sure what to do next. And, sure. um, and I realized that, okay. Um, so around this time, again, a big thing, Azam Khan was, again, of course, one of my big inspirations. So um, Azam Bhai actually came down to see me perform. Yeah. And he liked me very much. Uh, every now and then, he would, he'd come by and say, so he'd encourage me doing very well. And Azam Bhai's knowledge about mm -hmm. Western music was Beatles and yeah. CCR. So it was nice to talk about his influence sure. and Joan Baez and all that. So we should, I should talk to him and try to get his views and about mm -hmm. the liberation war, etc. Then one, one av evening after the show, I used to live in Kamalapur. So I said, Azam Bhai, let me give you a drop. Mm. So even before we got into the car, we were strolling and having a cigarette. And he said, Mac, I mean, why is it that you are not doing Bangla songs? Ah. And I told him what I was just, I said, it's cat, like it's, it's rural, it's rustic, it's not for me. And even before I could finish the sentence, I was slapped. Because he was, you know, the typical elder brother, Mukti yeah. Jodhai and all that, so. Yeah, and so that I, didn't I sound I well didn't, to his ears. Yeah. No, and he said something to me which actually changed my whole life. Mm. He said, Mac, look, you're an educated Bengali, studying in English department. He used to call me an Englishman also. <laughs> you're an Englishman. I've heard that. Yeah. And he said, look, what you're doing is in front of those diners, you know, all drunks, and f so how long will you last here? How long will they remember you? And really, he said, how more popular will you make Michael Jackson by singing his song? How more mm -hmm. popular will you make the Bee Gees? Mm -hmm. How about your songs? So he said, uh, the last thing he said was, take all the drum out, put it right in, right in front of Sakura, line mm -hmm. them all up here, and start doing Bang Bangla songs, and we can have a second Mukti the next second freedom, yeah. a liberation war. And that really struck me, and he made me promise. So by about 87, um, I kind of went to Fuad Nasir Babu, the band leader, yeah. and I said, I think I have done something like a song. So, okay. so we, he and I sat down together, and it was a song I had written. Uh, I had a tune to it, and I could also tell him the kind of music I wanted. And instantly, over a, a couple of hours, a song was born. Yeah. And when we recorded it, I was pretty surprised with everybody's reaction. And, uh, and suddenly I realized that, okay, uh, it's not as bad as I thought. So, but to be entirely honest, after, after having spent 11 years in the rigors of Western music and all the genre, yeah. it was a very steep learning curve. I mean, sure. we, we were, A, we were performing almost every other night. Yeah. B, uh, we were learning. And see, we were getting paid for it. So yes. you know, it was, it was a complete package. Sure, that's what you did so, for a decade. So it was like a, 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 a prepaid scholarship right here in Bangladesh, which, sure. which I don't think I could have done in the West. Yeah. So the learning curve was, uh, gave me different ideas about yeah. Bangla music. And all we did was, most of the songs, you know, I think in English, by the way. Yeah. When I put them into paper, it's very hard yeah. to put your English thoughts into Bangla. Yeah. But then I saw that, since people seem to like it, uh, well, well, let, let, let me keep I mean, doing. No, I mean, the big thing is, and I know this as well, is of course, it's an issue which I grapple with, is uh, the editor of an English language newspaper. True. You are always, you know, those of us who are 
you know, let's say more comfortable in English, we always are aware of the fact that if you really want to reach people, if you really want to get out there and reach the, the, you know, the vast mass of the Bangladeshi middle class and beyond, then Bangla is really indispensable. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. what you have to do. And, yeah. and that, I think, you know, I think that's what took you from, you know, a supper club singer True. to the, the name you are right now. And I, mean, <laughs> I think maybe that's not what you were thinking at the time, but I think it's paved everything. And for us these days, when there's so many wonderful bands, you know, over the last several decades in Bangladesh, and of course, almost all the big bands are known for their songs in Bangla. True. We can't imagine that there was a time when that when it wasn't that way. But I mean, I think this is the thing. We can't really imagine what it was like in the late true, 70s. True, it was a completely true, different world, perhaps. True, true. Yeah. And, and, and uh, what, what really happened was we, we opened up a huge market, by the way. Because, yeah. you see, unless... Uh, Someone in, has to do it, and, of course. The yeah, studio's business mm -hmm. started picking up. Yeah. New bands started happening. And then yeah. the cassette industry, which is no longer, by the way. Yeah. Uh, there was one estimate that because of mm -hmm. our cassettes and because of the from, from, the, from the labeling to the recording to the mm -hmm. copying to the distribution, it was estimated at one mm -hmm. point or something like half a million people were directly involved mm -hmm. uh, in the music industry yeah. and put together the sound companies, the roadies, the engineers, yeah. the lighting people. So music as such was just not about you know having a good time. People were making money and they still do. Uh, we, we, uh, I, I in fact had the first professional sound system company because I really wanted to show people the way to go. Yeah. I invested all my life's money to sure. get, get, get into Singapore and getting a basic sound system. And in about three years' time, I could see there are many companies. Right now, uh, we have over 2,000 companies. Sounds right. and, well, and we're going to take know. a we're going to take a break here. When we come back, let's move it up. We'll talk a little bit about where the music industry is today. Okay. Sure. Um, Please join us after the break. I'm here with Mac Huck. We have lots of interesting things to talk about, so I hope you'll join us after this break. Thank you very much. Welcome back to Dhaka Tribune Presents Straight Talk. This is Zafar Subhan. I'm here with Mac Huck. Now, Mac, let's bring it up to date. We were talking a little bit about music in the 70s and 80s. Fast forward to 2018. What are your thoughts on the, the current music scene and what are the main issues? I know you work a lot with you know, the corporatization of music, piracy of music. These are bugbears of yours. Tell us a little bit about how you see the evolution, or should we say the devolution, of the music okay. scene. Well, first and foremost, I'm I'm really happy with the way music is going. In terms of, uh, I mean, there are a lot of fantastic bands. Oh yeah, I mean, so in terms of talent, uh, what we didn't have then was, I mean, basically way way back in the early '80s, early '90s, we were pop rock and reggae, and that was about it. Yeah. Right now, you got more specific genres, from thrash metal to rock, to, yeah. to heavy rock, to simple rock, to complicated rock, to hip -hop. fusion, hip hop. Uh, K-pop and you know the whole all, thing, all the whole gamut, so yeah. you have every kind of new so I think there's a whole bunch of music out there for you to choose and uh, you know as it is if you have the quantity you will definitely have the quality, quality so yeah. we are also getting to see some very very quality artists coming up some very quality bands coming through yeah interesting about this generation they they, they have a complete concept I mean you know, they have a song, they know exactly what the video is going to be like, they exactly know what the cover is going to be like, they exactly mm -hmm. know how the uh, projection of the music is going to And they also, from the dress to the way they talk on the media, the whole package, the whole package is there. Yeah. And there are lots and lots of event companies and a lot yeah. of management companies. That's all coming through. So it's so happening. That's the good, yeah. That's a, that's a really good part, um, and uh, uh, which didn't happen in our time. Uh, course, lots yeah. and lots of young musicians are actually been able to live on music Make a as, living. A, exactly, as a profession. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a uh, very good side of the story. Number two, as we know, um, the music industry is yeah. basically, I mean, in terms of hearing, because uh, we there's no CD, there's no cassette, nothing. Right. Yeah. And all we get to hear is people plugged into the headphones and they're listening, and we're not sure what they're listening to. And, yeah. And again, the other thing is. Um, Watching music, you know, yeah, you're as good as your last YouTube video. Sure. So say our times, we'd all sit together, listen to music, you know, grab each other, steal yeah. each other's music, copy it, you know, borrow it, you know, yeah, and we would find out who's got the latest album. Yeah, even that happened in Bengali music, but yeah. that has somehow disappeared, and now. Uh, 
my deepest concern is, you see, while the industries have grown, while yeah. the market has grown, uh, we have to realize it's the world's third largest business is music industry. Anyway, yeah. You know, sort of uh, after the oil industry, you have the aviation industry, and then probably music is the biggest industry sure. we can think of. Now, our in a population our size, half the population listens to music and loves yeah. music. We're I mean, music race. is an incredible, yeah. important thing for yeah. Bengali people. Yeah, absolutely. So that happens, but really, what's not happening? We're not been able to make a business out of it because here's where. Mm. Here's where the whole problem is. I mean, as I s always said, I'm not against corporate exploit, uh, okay. uh, uh, called sponsorship. Any corporation, sponsorship anybody Sponsorship is one thing, exploitation yeah. Exploitation, is you see, when they have a big show, let's say, for mm -hmm. instance, in some rural outback, they have a huge show where they have laser light. Now, for the people out there, that itself is something they haven't seen. No, and so that's if it, to so the extent that it brings yeah. music to people yeah. who otherwise yeah. wouldn't get it, that's a good thing. So you have 50,000 people, yeah. 100,000 people uh, so storming in. The problem is it's all free. Yeah. Now, so the corporations are all about their branding and their, sure. you know, how, how the logo is placed, how much people know about their product. Yeah. They have got no role in um, promoting music as such or making music a business. Yeah. Likewise, the same thing of the, the, the government before the election also a bunch of concerts and really yeah. world class concerts, but yeah. everything was free. Yeah. But unless and until people get into the habit of paying for music, yeah. there'll be no music left. Listen, hold that thought. We are going to take another break. Sure. Um, please join us after the break. I'm here in conversation with Mac Huck. Thank you very much. Welcome back. This is Dhaka Tribune presents Straight Talk. I'm Zafar Subhan. I'm in conversation with musician Mac Huck. Now, Mac, let's talk a little bit about Bangladesh's musical tradition, which is a big part of your musical identity. So let's talk a little bit. I mean, one of the things which has always struck me about being a Bangladeshi and living here is the amazing amount, not just of musical talent we have, but how music is so intertwined. You can yeah, I mean, say. Uh, as I was saying, you know, uh, being a snob and getting up into Western music, and when I started getting into Bangla music at any given point, yeah. sometime in 87, 88, I ended up in Kushtia, shrine of uh, Fakir Lalun Shah. Yes. I'd been there before with my father, but, it, you know, just another shrine of another great saint or something. But this time around, I went with some people, and, and something, uh, I, it's very hard to explain, people may say I'm superstitious, but something gripped me. Sure. Something gripped me there. And since then, I've had a huge transformation from who I was to what I am today. Uh, so it was, it was inside turning out, you know. It was always outside showing the world who I am, but the, the inside. Uh, it made me recluse. It made me discover things that I wasn't aware of. And, you know, this is the open university. My teachers in Dhaka University also agree. They gave me a degree in English literature, but they also say, Mac, this is where you, should, you went. This is where the university is, and it's yeah. up there for learning. So I, I ended up with, so it's been a journey of more than 30, 35 years, and mm -hmm. I go there pretty often. I also didn't have a guru then. Now I have a guru, Darvesh Hussain Ali Shalengta. And over the years, I realized that, you know, the, the sort of stripping the ego is the hardest thing to do for any human being. Sure. And at, at down to the boondocks where you go and live with them, I, I've, I've gone through the whole motion, you know, slept under a banyan tree, slept with the... So this is the richest of heritage, as you know, the UNICEF has said, it's an intangible uh, heritage of mankind, just not Bangladesh, sure. uh, Bowl Music in 2005, the declaration. Yeah. And I did that much before that. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a practice and a praxis. And what really shocked me is in Bangladesh, we don't have like three day long rock festival, yeah. where, you know, we, which we see in the West, like people yeah. camping out and having food together and enjoying one show. But this does happen in Kustia. This yeah. does happen. So three day long, it's all people of all gender sleeping together, no one looking at it. There's no bias, there's no discrimination, no one looking at uh, somebody, there's no sort of sort of sexual harassment of the stuff. Everybody's sharing food, everybody's, you know, fond of anybody's singing and dancing, and this goes on for three days and night till you become a zombie. Yeah. 
And this is what I said. If you're talking about roots rock, this, this is, is it. it huh? And this made me develop a huge connection with the bowls. And I am, I've got a probably now over 200 bowls, like my thick friends. Yeah. So um, my book, Bauliana, Worshipping yes. the Great God and Man, was a consequence of this particular exper experience. And, and I've tried to explain to city bred, bred folk what it is. You see, we tend to look at culture in a very, very... Uh, we, we have concretized culture in the sense mm -hmm. that what we think is culture is culture. That's not the way it is. Because mm -hmm. uh, culture, if you perhaps know, comes is a derivative from the word agriculture, okay. which means uh, some intelligent people know how, the, know how to control nature for production of food, which ultimately feeds. But the word here is rather Hitlerian. It's the word is control. Mm. Similarly, culture. Us educated elite, we decide what is going to be culture, and that's what we try to feed the media. Mm -hmm. But really, it's a bottom-up process. Of course, yeah. If the you're going to talk to about culture, people, so we yeah. have all these conflicts about, I mean, we, we talk about lofty ideas of being secular, but we, ha we don't live a secular life. Sure. When down in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the Akras, no one even cares whether you're Hindu or a Muslim, if we, we sit together, we eat together. We have serious religious discourse. But no one misunderstanding it always ends with a hug and you know, no yeah. hard feelings, you know, until we meet again. So uh, that is your culture. And our, what we're getting in the city are like snapshots. Yeah. Uh, late, so we decide on, okay, this two or three. And so we're ending up with like eight or ten bows we repeatedly show on television and yeah. that joke called a folk music yeah. festival or whatever. And the real culture is lost. So is this something that you think we're moving away from now in 2018? Is, was it once upon a time far more pervasive in this region, in the Delta region of Bengal, Bangladesh? And is it slowly dying out? Or do we think, actually, if you go down outside of the big cities, it still is vibrant as it well, ever I mean, was? There's, there's, there's absolutely no chance of it dying out, because okay. in fact, it's gotten more vibrant than That's ever. That's fantastic The, the only, only thing is, we have been completely, we have ignored. We've been them, ignorant about it. We no, don't know. Huh? And to the extent a lot of us feel this is, you know, good Manus, they're from poor people, there's a subordinate culture. But no, mm. we are actually subordinate. We don't mm. even know anything about them. Mm. If you need to sit down and sit with the lyrics and the, you know, the kind of discourses we go through, the serious intellectual discourses, that doesn't yeah. even happen in our talk shows, by the way. Yeah. We have lots of people unloading problems and complaints, no solutions. But sure. Fakir Lalan has given solutions. Yeah. I mean, those solutions are even effective today. What he said 200 years back is valid and relevant today 2018. So sure. every time we have a movement against uh, the fundamentalist or whatever, you'll see people walking the street with banners, with quotations from Fakir Lal and Shah. Yeah. So that's how relevant it is. So when it comes yeah. to struggle, when it comes to a fight against any form of, uh, any form of injustice, yeah. it's Oppression. the bowels. Yeah. Now why we don't give them the space in the city is because they speak the truth. Yeah. Because uh, they, are against, they are against capitalism without using the word capitalism mm -hmm. or without, you know, and, and they're all about rights for the human being. And they, they happen to represent almost 90 percent of your general population. Do you think things should swing back a little? Because one of the things which I'm noticing in Bangladesh today is it seems, you know, so much of discourse in Bangladesh is sort of dominated by urban elites, you know, people living in the cities and stuff. And I think that's changing. And so as that changes, as, you know, people from the villages, which is the vast majority of, of, of Bangladeshis, after all, are getting heard more, getting more of a platform, perhaps even the... Uh, uh, the the spirit of Bangladesh will change a little, and I won't say it'll. Uh, this is something new. What it is is this is what it always was, but it's just coming to the surface more. Is that something you think we can be hopeful for? Well, we can be hopeful only we, as as you said. I mean, let's not dictate terms on our terms. Yeah. I mean, if we're going to have a shadow shango, let's mm. not decide on how the television or how the media wants it. Let's mm -hmm. decide on how they do it, and we follow them. Yes. Let's see how their discourse, even how you eat, even the social rights respect for elders and the bhakti and all of that put together is something that is worth educating our city folks yeah. because see even how we eat in the table is yeah. so politically incorrect yeah we still although we eat with spoken fork and spoon mm -hmm. and we think those poor people out there don't even know how to eat no they're mm -hmm. wrong if mm -hmm. they sit with them and eat with them do you have to sit together yeah. they'll wash your hands together they'll put your food together they'll be signal for you to start you finish until the last child or the last old man hasn't finished eating, you cannot leave your seat. There's a reason for all of this. All of that. Yeah. So because food is Sheba, yeah. food, only three things are not in the hand. One is 
they do, when we are born, when we die, and how the food is going to be served to us. So this yeah. is an act of God. Yes. So when you're serving food, it's Sheba, you're giving a f service of God to your fellow human being. And so that, that's a vast concept. We have, we talk about food, we talk about food shortage, but we really don't know how food has to be consumed, especially sure. us, and we yeah, waste such a lot. Eating. Yeah, nothing, we nothing don't can do be wasted. Yeah. So there's lots and lots and lots of stuff that can be learned. Yeah. And uh, those are, I mean, I'm just giving you a brief snapshot within Absolutely. this little bit about what, what else is possible. There's a lot and lot of, we talk about, I mean, we talk about gender inequality, we talk about women's right. It, it has been, uh, it's very fashionable today, but it's yeah. been there for the last 200 years. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, I mean, you, when, you, when you hear that like half a million people were in Kustia during, you will not hear of one report, you as a journalist, that's that there right. was one of an incident where a woman was yeah. harassed. Yeah, so you have that respect, you have yeah, that dignity, yeah. you have that equality, and it's been yeah. there for hundreds yeah. of years. We do not have a gender yeah. bias. We yeah. do not have a gender bias. I mean, you yeah. know, uh, women have like, much more higher, uh, they're in the hierarchy of respect much it ahead of men. You know? so, so all put together, uh, I personally feel that we still have a lot to learn. And yeah. uh, I think uh, the cultural ministry and sure. they're trying in their own ways, but I think the process has got to be slightly rearranged for people to understand better and appreciate it more. Okay. Well, on that note, I think we're going to have to call it, uh, call it a day. But I wish this would have gone on longer. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, so much for being here with us, Mac. And thank you for tuning in. Uh, this has been Dhaka Tribune presents Straight Talk. Zafar Zaban speaking in conversation with Mac Huck. Please tune in next week. Thank you very much. Thank you.